everybody. Um, I am Lauren Byrne from HDEO. So I'm uh, also a HD researcher and family member, but I am on the board of HDEO. Um, and I've been working with the research committee for the last few years. I'm here with Seth Rothberg, who I'll get to introduce himself. Hey everyone, happy to be here as well. Uh, similar to Lauren, a uh, you know, fellow community member, not a researcher, not as smart as her. Uh, but you know, still uh, have a few jokes like she does, so I'll take smart that. Smart in different ways, smart dynamic different ways. too. Uh, um, but yeah, I recently, well, I guess not recently anymore, but I joined the board, board earlier this year, uh, really focusing on like the advocacy side of things, really trying to help empower some of our young people who are impacted by HD and excited to be here and I'll kick it on over to Peter. Hi everyone, um, thanks Lauren and Seth for uh, inviting me and, and, and giving me the chance to tell everyone about our new study, Generation HD2. My name is Peter McCulgan, I'm a clinical science leader on, on the Tom and Arson program at Roche. So just to kind of give a kind of uh, why we're here, um, we decided as HGO to do some of these sessions where we get to talk in a much more conversational way to the leaders of these pharma companies that are leading these programs of HD um, clinical trials um, and therapeutic programs. Um, Peter has been very kind to, to go ahead with us after um, we had a really great session back in our Congress in, I think, March, and is going to present some of the recent um, released information on a new trial called Generation HD2. Um, so I'm going to let Peter kind of go through those slides, and then we're going to we're not grill him, but um, try and um, ask questions in a way that we can hopefully um, make it as accessible as possible and, and understandable as possible for everyone at home. Go ahead. Thanks, Lauren. So, um, so the new study is called Generation HD2. Um, I'll just share my, my disclosures first. Um, I just want to give a, a, really, um, a really brief summary and then we can go on to some questions and answers. So Generation HD2 is a dose finding study um, with three key objectives to evaluate safety, biomarkers and clinical efficacy trends for two, two different doses of Tom and Urson, 100 milligrams every 16 weeks and 60 milligrams every 16 weeks. And um, there'll be a, a placebo um, group as well. Um, the study will be a minimum of 16 months duration. And the study will include a total of 360 participants. So that will be 120 um, per, per arm. And that will include individuals with either uh, prodromal or early manifest HD. Um, and so because we're taking, um, because safety is one of our key objectives, we're gonna ask an independent data monitoring committee to review clinical imaging and biomarker data every four to six months. The, uh, the inclusion criteria includes age 25 to 50, with a CAP score of 400 to 500. And um, as I mentioned, it will include prodromal and early manifest individuals. And this is broadly equivalent to the new, new HDIS station system of two for the prodromal group and three for the early manifest group. In terms of countries, it'll take part in around um, 15 uh, different countries. Great. So I think I can already say that there's a lot um, of words that we might need to clarify. Do you have further stuff to go through, Peter? Or do you no, the, this, this is just the countries and, and this is just the, the acknowledgement. So happy to jump okay. into questions. Could we bring back the slide, just given that summary and then just to highlight a few things that we can talk about, I think maybe between me and Seth. Um, I think things that I'd like to talk about with uh, to make it more clear to the community, I think, what is this HDISS um, that I don't think um, everybody knows about yet? What is CAP score? Um, uh, you know, what, what are the biomarkers? What does that mean? Um, so I don't know if there's anything else, Seth, but we could probably Maybe start to share the slides and go from there. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great point. Maybe it's kind of starting on uh, what you mentioned about what is this kind of staging system, and I, not not that you don't have to go into full details, but maybe a high level of what is a stage two or stage yeah. three. So, so the staging system has been has been published recently by a number of um, academics in the HD community and and um, industry partners. And the staging system was 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 set up to try and um, add more clarity, particularly to the prodromal pre-manifest um, terminology that, that, that's used in HD. And so, stage two. Um, is those that have have Huntington's disease and have functional impairments. So that might be work or finances or um, um, self care and things like that. And stage two is when uh, people don't have any functional impairments. So they would have very subtle signs of HD that might be really subtle things in terms of motor deficits or, or subtle things in terms of cognitive deficits and 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 that stage and so in in generation HD2 um, our early manifest group is broadly equivalent to stage three and, and our prodromal group is broadly equivalent to stage two there are uh, stages as well stage one and stage zero stage one is related to changes in biomarkers so that's changes when we look at brain scans and, and stage zero is um, when someone has the the hd gene expansion i think it might be important to kind of um emphasize kind of the rationale for creating such a staging system and obviously this is out of your remit peter so i'm is that in the same for those listening? So the ISS stands for the Integrated Staging System. Um, and the ideas come from kind of other fields like cancer or things that have these very clear landmarks to define different stages in, in a disease, which has been really, um, really important for drug development for those different types of diseases. So this was really made to be a research tool and very much important for driving clinical research, um, not to be confused with previous stages of um, when maybe someone would have been told they've got stage one Huntington's disease in the clinic when they were given a, a diagnosis and called manifest HD. It's trying to move away from that so we can start looking earlier um, in the disease span and maybe treating earlier. So it's it's the first kind of it's the tool that's been needed to start going closer to the prevention trials and perhaps um, someday will help us get to the point where we can do um, trials in people that don't have symptoms, but we're not quite there yet, but that's kind of why that, that staging system was, was brought about. Peter, could you maybe uh, just share kind of like the, I mean, you mentioned kind of safety and efficacy, but for those who are like, well, what is, what does safety mean? What does that? What does effectiveness mean? Maybe share kind of the goals. Yeah, of course. Um, so we want to we want to be sure that the doses that we're looking at in the new study are safe. So um, when we look at things like uh, adverse events, so you know side effects of medication, we want to ensure that the, the side effects, if there are any, are are manageable or tolerable. Um, in terms of biomarkers, we look at things like CS CSF mutant Huntington. So this is the level of, of the mutant Huntington protein in the cerebral spinal fluid. And, and this is, of course, something that we've looked at in the phase one study and, and generation HD1, the, the phase three study. And so we're going to assess this in the new study as well. And there we want to see that we're lowering CSF mutant Huntington. Um, and then we'll also look at clinical measures. So um, we want to see a trends of, of clinical efficacy. And that means that we want to see some sign of um, either slowing the disease or, or potential, um, potential improvement. And, and we use measures here like the total functional capacity skill or the composite UHDRS. And these are measures that assess function for TFC, but also cognitive and motor aspects of HD with the CUHDRS. And, and, and these help us understand that if the drug can, can, can slow the disease and, and then th that, can, that can give us confidence then to move forward to a bigger study. Awesome, thanks. And then 
you know, the other part, you mentioned a cap score between 400 and 500 before asking my question, maybe just for those who are saying, what is a cap score? Briefly yeah. could explain it. I know it's like, you know, there's a number, there's a calculation, there's a formula, right? Yes. So a, a cap score is something that, that's used a lot in HD research. And, and it's a measure that includes age and the, the CAG repeat length. And it gives an indication of what we call disease burden. And so that's the, the amount of, um, the, it's, it's really, it can be thought of as the, the, extent, the effect of the mutant Huntington protein over, over um, a certain, a yeah, certain like age. Like an accumulation so, of the accumulation of having the HD mutation. So exactly. everyone has the HD mutation when they're born, but there's something that happens as we get older that leads to more burden that eventually leads to disease. So that's kind of it's what we use. And it, it tends to um, associate with all of those clinical measures that Peter talked about and all those things that we're looking at efficiency. A lot of things that we are looking to see if they're a good biomarker for HD, we see if they're related to the CAP score um, or disease burden score. Um, so. And and the the reason we're looking at this age group of twenty five to fifty with the specific CAP range is is we did an analysis um, of the the previous study and we find that people within that age group, um, within that CAP score that had treatment every 16 weeks on the 120 milligram dose, there was signs of potential benefit. Um, it's important to say that that analysis is what we call post hoc. So the study wasn't set up to ask that question, but it gives us a sign that um, in this subgroup, there may be benefit. And it's important to say that it's it doesn't mean that there, there's not benefit in people who are older, people who have other CAP scores, but we want to first confirm the signal in this subgroup with a view then to expanding, hopefully to people beyond that age range or beyond those CAP scores. But we want to first confirm the signal we've seen in the previous study with, with a view to expand later. I think it might be also good to add, Peter, that it wasn't just maybe potential directional right direction of where things are going but there's see correct me if i'm wrong but some of those other biomarkers that suggested um a negative effect or something that could bad that's happening was less in yeah uh, in exactly. that, even that, that little group as well so things like neurofilament light which is a biomarker that tells us about that brain cell health or like if there's injury going to them so with the higher doses and, and faster and um, more frequent dosing they saw a much higher uh, a spike in this this marker that went on again but that was much less in this subgroup um for example yeah exactly so and 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 in, in younger individuals than in the previous study the 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 increase the increases in, in in nfl were less weren't um weren't seen and also the, in terms of clinical outcomes, so um, at the at the higher doses and the older age groups, the the clinical outcomes, um, at least for the treatment every eight weeks, were in the worst direction, and, and there was less of that effect seen in the, in the younger group. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that being said, and I, I mean, I, I I know the calculation for the CAP score, and so you know, thinking thinking about it, if someone has a forty four repeat they would need to be at least 39 years old to hit that 400 mark cap score. And again, I'll let you guys do the calculations, but that's kind of what I saw. So like to me, how are we supposed to aim to get that younger 25 to 30 year, year old audience? I guess um, another thing to add, I think what's coming in from our community from when, especially I think the Huntsman and Seas Youth Organization, we hear younger people I think maybe some of the expectations of the community was that it would be actually a lot younger, but I think um, it's a really important point, I think, to touch on of this bottom limit of the CAP score and why that, the importance of that and what that means actually um, in reality for the community. So I, I think with, with the CAP score, the reason there's the, the upper bound and the lower bound is that it's, 
so the the way we identified a, this group in the previous study is we looked at um, everyone in Generation HD1 of baseline, and we did what's called a median split. So we essentially split the group in half by based on CAP score. And in the previous study, um, you had to have a, a CAP score of greater than 400. So by, by doing that median split, it means that we were between 400 and 500. And so that's why there's, there's a lower bound there. Um, and we also did a median split based on age and, and that gave us, so that's how we arrived at the age 25 to 50, CAP score 400 to 500. But, and, and, and Seth, to your point, I think that we, we want to, we want to first confirm what we've seen before in this in the small population, but then we want to extend the criteria further. Then, when when we um, hopefully when we move on to another study, and um, just to add, I think maybe what needs to be kind of reiterated of why there's a bottom cap score is also this idea that we need to be able to measure an effect. Yeah. So there's, um, I think which isn't obvious, I think, when, but when you're designing a trial, and the big reason why we can't yet go earlier into this prevention trial, um, and because we need to be sure that there's going to be some kind of clinical changes, um, and that's where that, that um, estimation comes from. So we know that on average, people with 400 or, or so are going to have these measures or changes in their clinical scores or the tools that are going to be used to measure if the drugs work in. Whereas if you go to someone at 300, they may not have those changes yet and they may not have it in the course of a year or two. So it's very much, you have to kind of give and take with these things to be able to design a trial. Because if there's already a lot of number, a lot of patients being put in this trial, if you had it go earlier, then you might have to increase the amount of people. Exactly. It's a bit of a balancing act. So why would we want to go earlier? Because the, the, the data tells us, and, and certainly within the community, the, the hypothesis that if we go earlier, we can have the, the biggest benefit. We also need to um, not go so early where the trials would be so long and would require so many people that it would be unfeasible to do it. So it's a bit of a, as Lauren, as you said, it's a, it's a bit of a balance. Now. Yeah, no, and I, and, I, and I think that definitely makes sense, I guess, more and appreciate the clarity of like younger adults. Cause yeah, it's like, what does that mean? Does that mean someone that's 25 to 35 or is that something else? But that's where I was trying to get a sense of, you know, of course the higher the repeat, you gotta kind of balance out the higher repeat or and or higher age versus younger age to, Get that cap score. Yeah. 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 So it, it probably to get some, if someone's 25, they probably need to have a CAG repeat that's quite low. And um, I can't, I haven't worked it out, but I imagine they would need to be 40 or something to reduce to, to fit the criteria, perhaps. But yeah, I think it's it's important that something maybe we can work on as a community of how we um, market that and make sure it's not misinterpreted by family members. Um, I think maybe that was the initial perspective and why people were questioning it. Yeah, I, I think it's important to say that the, the CAP score is is a research tool and that it, there, there's lots of other things that, that, that affect, um, you know, progression and HD and disease burden and things like that. So it's, uh, you know, it, it can it act, acts as a guide in terms of, of research or we're designing trials, but there are other things that um, also come into play. So... Yeah, well, speaking of that, I know, I believe I saw, I was able to get a sneak peek of your, one of your slides for EHDN, and uh, I saw that I think one of the exclusion criteria is something along the lines, and don't quote me, but they can have a, I think, previously participated in some type of ASO study, and so, like, that being said, if they were previously in the Roche study, but kind of fit this, this bucket, are they, can they still potentially qualify after like a washout period, which means they're off that potential treatment? So, so people that were in the previous row studies who were on placebo um, have the potential to enroll in the new study um, as, as long as, as um, the, the sites aren't finalized, but, but if they are looked after at a site that um, is involved in the study, then they can, they can enroll. I think the, the question of um, 
in terms of people that had previous active treatment on the Tom and Erson studies. This is something that that um, we talk to um, HD experts in the com community and, and, and many community members. Um, and I think with the new study, if we included people that had previous um, exposure to Tom and Erson, it could be then difficult to interpret the results of the new study. Um, but I want to emphasize that we, we, are, we will continually um, look for other clinical trial options that, that, that these, um, the, these people can be involved in. You know, their involvement in Generation HD1 and, and the previous studies was absolutely essential for us to get to this stage. So as more data comes in from the new study, we will keep it under constant review in terms of what clinical trial options these, these individuals can, can uh, be involved in. So we, we, we definitely haven't forgotten about them. And this is something that we will continue to look at. And just for a bit more, what kind of options would they be? Maybe like a, an open label extension or something that they could be, or um, I don't know what the term is, um, for when you kind of can give a treatment um, that hasn't been marketed yet. Exactly. So, so the, 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 these are the things that, that, that we will keep under review. And, and once we have more information and more data coming in from the new study, we will be looking at these options um, for, for, for people that have previous active treatment in Tom Yeah. And yeah, and so if they were on like, I'm going to just throw out like a different trial, but again, they haven't participated in that in a year or two because it just didn't work out. What is that? How, like, do they just kind of work with the site to get a sense of if they might be able to qualify in this one? So in terms of how do they find out? Um, no, so like if they're on a, you know, there's been a few other trials that unfortunately didn't work out in the past few years, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's why, you know, my thought is, again, because there's all these different trials, not just the Roche one, you know, they want to make sure they have another option. And so that's, that's why I was curious about this whole washout period. If they're not, if they weren't on, top, you know, on your prior trial, but they were in a different clinical trial from a different company. So how, how did that work? Part of the exclusion includes um, ASOs. So that would be exposure on to Tom and Erson before, but also in any other ASO trial as well. Um, and it also includes- Which would include WAVE or yeah. triplet. Yeah. And, um, it also includes gene therapy as well. I, I think and I, I, I completely appreciate that the, it's, it's really difficult for people to be involved in the study and then because of their involvement in the study, they can't be involved in another study. And this is, I think this is something that we struggle with as a community. Um, and it's, I think it, it's really challenging because for us to do the trials and to, to be able to assess whether someone has responded to a drug or whether a drug hasn't worked, we need to understand how they have done on a single drug as opposed to if they've been on other drugs before it, then it just gets very difficult to interpret and, and we don't know then whether a drug works or not. But I, I mean, I, I completely understand that it's, it's really difficult for, for patients involved to your in studies that, 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 that don't work on it. Yeah, I think um, I think one thing we can probably learn from the community is that being on a trial doesn't mean you're getting a you're necessarily getting a drug that's going to help Huntington's disease. And we have to so much credit to all the people that take part in trials and the motivation and um, continued efforts from the community are continue to be inspiring. But I think we've had some stark kind of reality checks of that. It doesn't mean you're going to get help with your symptoms. It might actually make things worse. So, in a safety point of view, these rules have to be applied for a lot of not just to make sure the drug works, but also to ensure the safety of all of the patients in the community. So, if you can't get into a trial right now for these strict reasons, it doesn't mean that you never will, but it might be the best thing for you um, at this moment in time. And things will change, as Peter says, if if a year or two into the study and there's better outcomes, 
then that shifts the mindset of the committee and then we adapt and perhaps let people that have been in different drugs that it might not happen but that's kind of how it's going to probably happen over the next few years it will be based on this how we get on in the next few trials and different programs to get to the next stage but and just to add to that i think you know you make a great point lauren it's all it's also about like expectations of the community i know a lot of people were, were excited when Roche was originally in the phase three prior to this, right? And, you know, personally, this is my own personal, and this is, to, you know, putting my patient advocate hat on, is like, I, I don't always use the word cure because of that, because it sometimes if trial does, if the trial doesn't work out, right, then people may lose hope, even though there could be other opportunities down the line. And so I think that's a big thing is that this could work, but we don't know unless we are willing to participate and get people to, you know, it, it is a risk, but it's also, there could be a benefit. We don't know these things in, until we try, but I think that's why I think, you know, research is important in finding ways to participate, but also just understanding like, you know, yes, I, I am gonna, you know, participate and it may work, it may not work, but at least I'm actually making a difference in the research side of things. That's my that's my personal thoughts on it though. I do, I, 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 I completely agree. I think we, e even with, with every single trial that we do, we learn something new, and 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 I've, I think we we get a step closer to 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 finding you know effective disease modifying treatments, and I, I think to quote Ed Wild, there there's no there, there's no failed drug trial, but with every trial, I mean the, the trials don't. You know the trials don't always pan out the way we we want them to, but we always learn something new that we can then take to the next trial and um, and and get closer to that to that ultimate goal. And um, maybe it's worth touching on um, as there's a lot of different opinions in the community, scientific or family members included, about kind of doing another trial after the phase three didn't work. Um, and I you know I think it's worth if there's any hope or any rationale that this will work. And I think um, there's different opinions on this, but um, maybe you want to touch a bit on that, Peter, of kind of yeah. why some people will be hesitant about going forward to this trial. And yeah, so, and I think given what happened with Generation HD1, as I mentioned, where we saw the, the uh, people on treatment every eight weeks, the outcomes were, were worse than people that didn't get treatment. And of course, I mean, this is something that we we have to have to avoid. Now, I think the reason why we 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 go forward with the new new phase two is because when we looked at the data and we looked at the uh, individuals who got treatment every sixteen weeks, and we looked at the level of Tom and Erson, um in in the system in the CSF. For those that had uh, lower levels, um, so if we split the levels and you know we split the group in half, and we look at those that had high exposure and low exposure, for those that had low exposure, we see that we can avoid some of the the signs that that something isn't good happening. So we we see lower um, increases in ventricular volume. We we have suggestions that we can avoid the increases in NFL. And I think based on that and based on the potential benefit, um, albeit the post hoc signal that we see, that gives us confidence that we, we can potentially avoid or mitigate um, the, the things that weren't so good with having the potential benefit. And this is, this is really the rationale for, for going into the new generation of C2. So. And maybe that's a nice kind of branch and stuff to talk about what steps you've gone in this design to yeah. avoid those things and what you're trying to avoid. So the, this is the, this is why I've I've highlighted you know safety as, as one of the um, key objectives in the new study because this is something that is very very much on our mind and um, so we're going to ask the IDMC. This is Independent Data Monitoring Committee. So this is a group of independent scientists who will look at the clinical data. So they'll look at, you know, motor assessments, cognitive assessments, functional assessments. They'll look at the brain imaging data, so the MRI scans, and they'll also look at the biomarker data. 
We'll ask this um, IDMC group to look at this data every four to six months so that we can, so that they can know in advance um, if they see something that, that concerns them um, so that we don't get to the end of the study and, 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 and we see something that, that bad's happened so we can pick it up as early as possible and then make decisions then um, about what we do. So, so that, that's really our, our, our focus in terms of the safety to have this independent group that review this data at, at, at regular intervals. And then that maybe means, just oh, oh sorry, um, no, I was just going to add no. to um, maybe highlight some of the changes in terms of the design, like the differences in dose and and what things have changed since the phase three. Yeah, of course. So the doses that we're looking at now, um, so there's a couple of differences. We had what was called the loading dose on Generation HD one. So this is where we we give a dose at four weeks, and then we so essentially there's. It's like an extra dose at the start of the study, and that's so that we achieve what's called steady state. So, so we see mutant hunting and lowering reach reach a, a level faster, and that, and that was that was the rationale for the loading dose. Now, in the new study, we will not have a loading dose, so people will will get treat they'll get their first treatment, and they'll get their next treatment in sixteen weeks, start their next treatment in, in four weeks. So, we're not having the loading dose in the new study. And um, we're given treatment every 16 weeks, whereas in the old study we were given, in, in one dose in arm, we were given treatment every eight weeks. So the treatment is, is less frequent and without the loading dose. And the idea there is that there is less, less amount of, of tominarsin in the system than we saw at the higher doses where the things that weren't so good happened. Yeah, no, and that being said, I think it's, I mean, personally, would say it's it's good to see that you're able to kind of spread it out a little bit more every 16 weeks because, you know, if you think about, I think sometimes just in the healthcare space, we sometimes always say, oh, it's the patient, the patient, but then you forget there's the caregiver. Maybe they have pets or maybe they have kids and they got to figure yeah. out the child care, right? And I think this gives more opportunity to feel like it's not as burdensome to say, oh, I, I got to come in every month or every other month, not thinking that could be six to 12 PTO days that they got to take off. So I just wanted yeah. to highlight that. because And also that... just not coming in. It's not having a yeah. invasive lumbar puncture. Me and Seth have both have researched lumbar punctures and they're yes. fine. And we're like advocates for doing it for research. But if so, I could choose to have it or have one every eight weeks over every 16 weeks. So yeah. the, this, this was a big consideration actually when we were di designing the study and, and we spoke to many, um, many members of the HD community. And a lot of the feedback we got was, you know, the, the, this group of individuals is going to be younger. They might be in full time employment. They might have, you know, have childcare responsibilities. So we we tried to slim down the study as much as possible, and add in as much flexibility as possible, so that um, it it made it easier for 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 those involved. So for the minimum sixteen month period, there'd be seven clinic visits. So that's much much less than than previous. That's awesome. That being said, of uh, and I know I feel like I keep saying that, but the you mentioned kind of some of them might be you know still work working whether it's full time part time. I think I again correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that's why we're having this this discussion is that it mentioned the requirement of having a study companion. Yeah. And so what's the rationale behind that? Just because from my own again I was in an observational study, very different, but um, I did do lumbar puncture spinal tap and I was able to you know do this myself so maybe explain that rationale so it, it's a really good question and this is something we um we we went back and forth a little bit on but I think the the reason why we then landed that a study companion was um essential is because for the total functional capacity scale um the way you the way you a, a neurologist will complete that scale is, is get information from from the trial participant but also from you well if we don't do in clinic um I'll, I'll talk to the patient but i'll also talk to their family member and, and the, the reason for that is so is we get as much information as possible so that the tfc is as accurate as possible and because the TFC is one of our primary clinical endpoints, so it, it's one of the key measures that we're looking at, 
we wanted to make sure that um, it's as accurate as possible. And, and the only way to do that is to have a study companion. And, and this is very much consistent with recommendation um, that we've had from the FDA, who, who has said, you know, if you want the data to be robust, then you, you need to have a study companion. So it's, it's not I ideal, but I think in terms of having robust data that we can use to make decisions on whether to move forward, it, it, it's, it's something that we need. I think it might be important also to mention, um, you know, this is also very specific to when people have Huntington's disease. And we know how Huntington's disease can affect one's ability to have insight into bone symptoms and, and that. And it's not necessarily how you would do a study in some in a prevention trial where people don't have symptoms and still have a good kind of perspective. I think it's because you're we're still looking at that stage two and stage yeah. three of the ISS, and these are although very still very healthy potentially and still have a lot of functionality. Um, they there still can be discrepancies in one's ability to kind of assess themselves. And and with that companion, does it have to be the same person? Could it be like one one time it's a good friend versus an uncle versus so I, I, I de ideally it will be the, the the same person throughout the study um but we understand that you know circumstances can change and and, and we can we, we can adapt to that awesome awesome and then how can the community perhaps stay connected to what's happening and as you all i'm sure are if you're not already planning the figuring out the, the timelines of recruitment sites, all that, what, so, can, what can the community do? So in, in terms of timelines, we hope to start early next year. And, and if we can recruit within the year, then we um, we hope to, to complete the trial in 2025 and, and, and be able to, um, you know, be able to reach a conclusion whether, whether we, we see that there's potential benefit and, and, and we can move forward. In terms of the community, um, you know, keeping up to date, um, HD Buzz is one of my favorite websites. So I think that's always a great way to to learn about not just our trials, but but all the trials. And we'll be we'll continue to um, be presenting at, at HSG in November, and of course at, at CHDI in, in April as well. So at, at all of these conferences, we'll continually provide updates about about what we're doing and and, and how things are going. Thanks, Peter. Um, do you have any other things, Seth, that you want to cover? Um, no, I mean, I, I appreciate this. I think it was good just to hear more about the ins and outs of participating and expectations and just like who can, who qualifies. As the sun comes out, I was, feel like I'm at like a, an angel coming from <laughs> down below. But um, no, this was, this is very helpful. I think just the community, it, is of course just trying to understand all the different trials also you know the difference between the previous one so we definitely appreciate you sharing what those differences are and you know looking forward to continuing to hear the, the updates as they come and really appreciate you kind of doing it in our format as well i think um, we had lots of great feedback after the last um, session we did i think it's a bit more accessible for our you know, demographics um, I, and in terms of keeping up to date, HDO will continue to um, post updates and videos and summarize a lot of the latest news. So um, for those listening, please keep, keep up to date with us. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you again, Peter. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. And always enjoy these tag teaming, Lauren. So I'm sure we'll do yeah. more of them. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll be in per, um, in real life on the stage in I know. Congress. I know. And have a whole are you, are you guys going to <laughs> Are you guys going to HSG? I'm not, no. But uh, the Congress we have in Glasgow um, in person. Uh -huh. So um, surely we could do something on stage to. Yeah, we could figure something out. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'll be at HSG. Are you going to okay. be there, Peter? Yeah, 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 I'll be there. Okay. Good to meet you in person. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Cool. Okay, well, that's us. I think Thanks, that's everybody. It. Cool.